I'd like to call this board meeting to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Do we have any additions or corrections to our agenda? Uh, other than the personnel addendum that is at uh, each of your places, that's the only, only addition we have. Can I get a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Okay, I have a motion. Anyone like to second? Second. And a second? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Moving on to our recognitions and presentations, starting with Ms. Uh, McIntyre with the Salina Education Foundation. Good afternoon. The first meeting uh, of your board in April is always really special to us because we take the opportunity to display some of the work that the Salina Education Foundation has been doing. Spring is a busy time of year for us. Um, I could not do this job by myself. That is why I have 16 wonderful trustees who help me. And I would love it if you would stand and let people recognize you. Bill Sturgis, Byron, Kate Bycroft back in the back, Valerie Andrews, Pam uh, Evans, Mary Schaefer. Oh, Gary Denning came in. Um, Katie Ebert's here. Thank you all so much for coming. This board, not this exact makeup, but a board came to the Salina Education Foundation after the creating the future process. And the teacher quality retention and recruitment uh, group made a suggestion to the Ed Foundation. Could we establish a grow your own teacher program? Now, the trustees are cautious folks, and we want to make sure that we are successful. And so we took our time in deciding this because we knew that it would take a million dollar endowment to fund the LIFT program. I am so proud to say that we reached that goal several years ago. So the LIFT program is secure for years to come. And today, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing three new uh, LIFT recipients. The LIFT process is a difficult one. There's a paper application that uh, the um, LIFT committee pours over. And we really, we look at grammar, we, lo we look at what you have to say, we look at what the recommenders have to say about you. We're, it's important to us that we do this correctly. Then we decide, who do we want to interview? What six people do we want to interview? And of those six people that we interviewed, we selected three this year. I also want to recognize the people on the LIFT committee that make the decisions about um, who we select. Would you all please stand? I know Brenda McDaniel is here and Nancy Kiltz. Um, and I, I could be missing some more, but we have three trustees. We have two uh, people from the community, which we think is very important since this community was so generous in supporting the LIFT program, we have two people from USD 305. So the three young women that you will hear from tonight um, were selected by, by this group and we're really, really proud of them. I'm going to introduce uh, Mackenzie Carlgren first. Mackenzie is a freshman at Kansas State University majoring in elementary education. She is a 2016 Central High grad Go Mustangs. She was first in her class. One of her recommenders say, and I'm going to give little pieces of what your recommenders say, say to, uh, about you. I think, I think you need to hear this, okay? Those who know Mackenzie know that she is fair and ethical. Her parents have taught her well to respect others, to have her own ideas, but to listen to others without judgment to make her own decisions and make the right choices. 
all while remaining grounded, in touch with reality, and incredibly, amazingly moral. Mackenzie. I want to thank the Salina Education Foundation and the Salina Board of Education for giving me this incredible opportunity. I feel truly honored to have such an amazing support system, which makes me really excited for my future as a teacher. I have wanted to become a teacher ever since I was little and played school with my sister. Unfortunately, I am younger than she is, which meant that only on rare occasions would I actually be able to be the teacher. Once I outgrew playing school with my sister, my love for learning and teaching grew in elementary school, where I started each year saying, this year is going to be the best year ever, and it never ended in disappointment. My teachers at this age were extremely influential on my life and showed me the importance of education and how to take pride in my hard work, which helped me to stay motivated later on. I want to become an elementary teacher because I want to make an impact on children that will help them have a better future like my teachers made on me. I believe that teaching is the best career for me because I have a passion for working with children and it is the best way for me to use my skills to help others. I have been around children a lot by babysitting, working in a nursery, tutoring, and as of most recently, volunteering at an after school program in one of the Manhattan schools. Although I have faced many challenges in my experiences with kids, it is so rewarding to witness the improvement a child has made by finally figuring out a problem on his or her own or by simply finding enjoyment in learning. Even on the most hectic days, I'm always eager to go back. Most importantly, I want to be a teacher because I can't imagine myself doing anything else. Receiving the lift allows me to fulfill my dream of becoming a teacher in the town that I love and grew up in. And I thank you so much again for your support and confidence in my future as a teacher. Thanks, Mackenzie. Riley Rundell is a senior at Central High School. She is a Sunday school teacher and has volunteered for CAPS, Child Abuse Prevention Services, since she was a little girl. She currently serves as a high school mentor for the Healthy Lifestyles Workshop sponsored by the Salina Education Foundation with support from Salina Regional Health Foundation. Her recommender reports that Riley is a superb listener and communicator. Her caring attitude is evidenced in every interaction, no matter how small. Riley is the reason many of the children want to come to church. She loves to help out. Riley. I also want to thank SEF, SEF and the Board of Education. Hi. <laughs> in the second grade, my teacher, Mrs. Daly, did this program where every student in her class got to be the teacher for a day. My day was filled with grading papers, making copies, and being the line leader for the entire day, which to a second grader is the coolest thing that could happen to you. <laughs> so if I had to pick a certain day that I wanted to be a teacher, it was that day. I felt more at home in that teacher's chair than I did at my desk, <laughs> um, which she probably regrets letting me do that. <laughs> but as I grew, so did my love of books and learning. My passion for getting others to learn increased with every year of schooling I went through. In my 13 years of public education, I had teachers that inspired me and drove me to the very brink only to bring me back and show me that I could do it. They pushed me further than I thought capable, but they made me stronger and smarter than before. And this district is filled with those excellent teachers. Those excellent teachers, they're my role models, and I want to be like them. And receiving this Lyft scholarship helps me become one of those excellent teachers. I hope, no, I'm determined to become one of those teachers. I hope that as a teacher, I not only teach reading and math, but I hope to inspire my students to follow their dreams like my teachers followed, made me follow them. And I hope to become the teacher that is worthy of this district. So thank you. Thank you to everyone on the scholarship board and thank you to all of you for giving me the best 13 years of education I could ask for. 
and I cannot wait to see you in four years. <laughs> Riley. Morgan Solden is a junior at Fort Hayes State majoring in elementary education. She currently is working as an instructional assistant at Sunset Elementary. Morgan graduated from South High in 2013, and this is a personal aside, Morgan, and was with the first group who performed at 305 Live, which is a uh, Salina Education Foundation project. I remember Morgan because she was so joyful. That's what I remember. From Morgan's recommendation, Morgan demonstrates exceptional interpersonal skills. She is successful in building and maintaining positive rapport with students. Morgan demonstrates caring and respect for students. She is positive and growth oriented and seeks out opportunities to work with students, Morgan. When I was a child, I knew that I wanted to be a teacher. After graduating Salina South High School in 2013, I chose Fort Hayes State University. My first three years of college, I attended on campus in Hayes. While on campus, I was very involved with, the, with Fort Hayes State University and the Hayes School District. I was a VIP ambassador for Fort Hayes State and was a substitute for USD 489. My last year on campus, I was introduced to a new teaching program. This program is called the Teaching Residency Program. The Teaching Residency Program allows for students to work within a district while earning their teaching degree. This program allows school districts to build their own teacher. I am now completing the Teaching Residency Program with USD 305. I am currently employed as an instructional assistant at Sunset Elementary School. Being an instructional assistant allows for me to teach students different lesson plans in small group settings every day. Every day is different and you never know what to expect from students. I wake up every day at 7.30 to go to, to school and I am excited. When I am a teacher, I hope to use the experience as an instructional assistant within my classroom every day. I want to thank the district for allowing this program to be a success and allowing myself to be a success as well. I appreciate the scholarship and cannot express my overall gratitude in the Salina Education Foundation for choosing me as a LIFT recipient. I feel humble and appreciative to so many people who have helped me get here. First off, I would like to thank the Salina Education Foundation for allowing this process to happen. Um, I, would like them, I would like to thank them for choosing me as a recipient and it is a great honor. This will really help me as I work towards my last year on my teaching degree. I would like to thank my parents, my grandparents, and of course, my family at Sunset Elementary School. Without all of these people, I believe I would not be as successful as I am today. I also wanna thank my mentor teacher at Sunset, Nicole Skidmore, for helping me support my dream as a teacher. Thank you very much. A little background on, on LIFT, we, uh, the Salina Education Foundation awards $5,000 per year as long as the student uh, is working towards an initial teaching cer uh, certification. We uh, bring you back to Salina and for every year that you teach, we forgive $5,000 a year with the ultimate goal of you staying here, raising your families and becoming a really productive member of our community. So congratulations, girls. Well, our other wonderful teachers apply for grants to the Salina Education Foundation, and we have recently awarded those grants. So um, I have a helper. His name is <laughs> Byron Norris. Um, I'm going to brag about him a little bit. He is um, ending his career with the Salina Education Foundation. Um, trustees can be uh, members of the board for three years and renew for three years. Uh, Byron has been a member of the Board of Trustees for six years, and he has served as secretary um, 
and so I will miss him dearly. And he tonight is giving out the certificates to the grant recipients. First off, we're going to talk about 21st uh, Century Advantage grants. These grants are a flagship grant program. They've been in effect since 1993. We've awarded over $600,000 to classroom grants. They are awarded annually for creative and innovative classroom projects. And our first uh, grant award recipient is Billy Joe Bonner, Central High. I'm going to uh, give you a little flavor of what these uh, grants do. Earth and space science students will construct 3D models of a spectroscope that astronomers use to determine the chemical composition of stars. And they will construct topographic maps of the Earth's surface drawn to scale. The 3D models help students visualize features represented by contour lines on topographical maps. Steve Ewing, Central High. Science students will use the large hallway aquarium and classroom aquariums to study the life cycle of a fancy guppy. Students will monitor uh, temperature, pH, and nitrate levels daily. This knowledge will be expanded on a field trip to Cheyenne Bottoms. Kim Curtis, gifted facilitator at Coronado, Stewart, Sunset, Huesner, Schilling, and Oakdale. Students will learn the foundations of design by defining a simple design problem uh, reflecting a real world want or need, and then generate and compare possible solutions. Define the criteria and the constraints of the design problem, evaluate the competing solutions, apply existing knowledge to new ideas, and finally, create original works. Nicholas Pauls, Coronado. Fourth and fifth grade students will participate in a free after school program dedicated to providing additional uh, opportunities for social interaction and reinforcing grade level standards through board games. Focus will be on communication, teamwork, problem solving, math fact fluency, and reading comprehension skills. Daylene Johnson, Cottonwood. Music students will learn how to tune ukuleles, which must be tuned every time the instrument is played. Each grade level will learn different skills, which increase with grade level. The students with instruments perfectly tuned will perform in class and in other venues. Yes. <laughs> my Cottonwood students want to thank you, and they are my family, and we are so excited and I'm especially excited because I've been trying to tune all 40 of them with my phone. So thank you very much. <laughs> the Allocations Committee learned so much. <laughs> you know, we learned so much. Lisa Hall, Middle Ark Ridge. English is second language students, and there are seven different nationalities will work with hands-on materials that will teach prepositional directions. Before, after, next to, below, above, and so forth are words that teachers use daily and can cause confusion. Having tactile objects that students can touch and manipulate make the directions meaningful. Kay Berger, Oak Oakdale. Students going to the school library will have the opportunity to engage in a maker space. This is a designated location that encourages students to explore and learn about various topics. Many of the activities are STEM activities that encourage hands-on activities to enhance the books that the students are currently reading. Creative art projects will be included, such as origami and repurposing old materials in a new and creative way. Shelley Parks, Oakdale. Kindergarten students will use items in the sensory table to encourage exploration and understanding of math concepts, to improve fine motor skills, and enhance academic and literacy skills. Sensory tables allow young students to discover the scientific properties of matter, like the difference between water and sand, or making a mixture of cornstarch and water to make a solid. Mary Harmon Schilling. 
Students will read short, high-interest books that deal with social skills and common misbehaviors. And I love this. One such book, My Mouth is a Volcano, deals <laughs> with a child blurting out inappropriate comments. Short lessons would be used to discuss behaviors specific to the library. The books will be available for staff checkout. <laughs> Isn't that great? Um, Kane and Wendell, South High. Biology students will use microscopes and slides of plant anatomy to learn about basic plant structure. The slides contain different parts, including roots, stems, leaves, and flowers. This activity is a valuable tool to help students improve observation and problem-solving skills. He hoped to be here, but um, he's working at a track meet, so um, didn't make it, but he wanted to. Elizabeth Burke, South High. Junior and senior social studies students will work collaboratively to solve a complex set of problems. Breakout EDU kits are similar to the popular breakout rooms, but will incorporate pre-made puzzles on decoding World War II code, deciphering the stock market, and exploring political races with a ballot box activity. Janet Sauber, South Middle. Students will visit the library to imagine, brainstorm, plan, collaborate, and create in makerspace. The library space is dedicated to tinkering and creation while challenging students and staff to view hands-on activities as a valuable and essential part of learning. The Makey Makey starter kits were purchased with proceeds from the school's Scholastic Book Fair, and the SEF will supply the remaining items. Pam Bergoon uh, Stewart. Kindergarten students will love imagination stations, which encourage exploration through creative play. Some of the themes include All About Me, Earth and Environment, Community and Careers, Food and Nutrition, Seasons and Weather, and Families. And students will also love working with new puzzles. Those are our 21st Century Advantage Grant Award recipients. <laughs> The other grant that we award um, March 1st for the next school year is called Outside the Box. And we want to take students outside the typical classroom setting. Um, Carol Brandt was instrumental in, in our um, um, putting this grant together. Let's get these kids outside into the communities. Let's, let's, um, let's get them out of the classroom. So they're called Outside the Box Grants. And they are awarded annually for projects that take students outside the typical classroom setting. Chad Newlick, represented by two of his students from Central High. Thank you for coming. <laughs> students will use four new sewing machines and a new serger to construct costumes for Central High's fall show, Shakespeare's A Mid Midsummer Night's Dream. 30 costumes are needed for the production, and the students will research, design, and build each one. Gina Turner, Meadowlark Ridge. The SEF continues to support this remarkable project that allows students to participate in the William Allen White Book Award celebration in Emporia. Students who read at least six or more William Allen White books are eligible to be in the book club and attend the ceremony. Students meet the winning authors, visit Peter Pan Park where White statue stands, and they also visit the house where White and his family lived. Amber Bohm, uh, Middle Lark Ridge. Students in the TLC program will participate in a service learning project, spreading kindness through character education. The purpose of their program is to help students understand the power of kindness, to show them they are capable of making a difference, and to inspire kindness in others. Examples of kind acts include taking chocolates and a kind message to people in the school, placing inspiring notes in library books for people to find, and celebrating the custodian's birthday. Jeff Hayes, Opportunity Now. The Opportunity Now garden will be expanded to utilize the area for food production. The garden project has evolved over the years into a special education vocational training program that is essential to Opportunity Now's school to career transition program. 
Students are involved in everything from the planning of garden beds to the purchasing of materials to the back-breaking work of moving rocks and dirt and digging holes. Gardening is a healthy leisure time activity that produces healthy food and is a lifelong hobby. Elise Pototnik, uh, Salina West Alternative. Students will learn basic life skills necessary for independent living. Personal hygiene, stain removal, laundry skills will be taught using their new washer and dryer. Instilling confidence and a sense of pride and personal appearance is the goal. Brittany Kissner, South High. As part of Salina Leadership Academy, Ms. Kissner was challenged to provide a special project that would have lasting impact on her school and community. The Summer Reading Club for Intensive Reading was born. This summer, a Summer Reading Club will be formed. Activities include Skyping with a young adult author, sign up for Salina Public Library cards, book it program with a local food establishment, and an end of summer celebration. Agnes Zadina, Agnes, did I mess that up? Zadina, is that the way you say it? Oh, <laughs> Not even I was close. way off. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Partners for Success, South High ELO students will participate in a team building exercise at the Webster Conference Center's ropes course. Building competence, self-esteem, and self-efficacy is the goal of the program. The ultimate goal is to encourage students to make healthier, future-oriented choices as young adults. The ropes course challenges students to push themselves to achieve success. And finally, Michelle Palmgren with a wonderful project called uh, Navajo Nation that the Ed Foundation has supported for several years. At-risk students will again visit the Navajo Nation where they will work on the reservation, helping families with chores like cooking and cleaning. The students and mentors will examine behavior and beliefs and tap into the spirit and traditions of the Navajo. That's what we have been up to the past couple of uh, months. And uh, we're proud to help our teachers. We're proud to identify new teachers. And uh, because of the remarkable support of this community, we're able to give these grants in the LIFT program. And I sincerely thank you. Moving on in our agenda to our You Make a Difference Awards with Ms. Jennifer Bradford Vernon. Good evening. <clears throat> the You Make a Difference Award is presented to staff members whose exemplary actions support students, colleagues, and the mission of Salina Public Schools. Recipients of these awards receive a lapel pin and a handwritten note personally delivered by a Board of Education member. Caitlin Hennig, Cottonwood Speech Language Pathologist. Caitlin's contributions at Cottonwood have made quite an impression, considering she is never physically present. <laughs> Located off-site, Caitlin can be seen on a whiteboard during IEPs and special education meetings. She provides speech and language support using teletherapy. Thank you, Caitlin, for making a difference. Peggy Ashenbrenner, CKCIE, Early Childhood Special Education Teacher. Peggy is a teacher who makes sure each of her students feels individually cared for. Her field trips into the community develop students' social and language skills. She leads family game and cooking nights, movie nights, and more. Thank you, Peggy, for making a difference to preschool children and adults in their lives. Steve Dortzweiler, Human Resources Coordinator. Steve has provided invaluable support to the Partners for Success program. He has been part of mock interviews, guest panels, application and resume sessions, and more. His contributions have helped better prepare students for their employment search. Thank you, Steve, for making a difference for Partners for Success participants. Thank you. Thank you. Moving on to the approval of our consent agenda items, which start with our minutes of our March 28th, 2017 regular meeting, the minutes of our April 4th, 2017 special meeting, our personnel reports, our financial reports, including our March bills list and our March bond bills list, our bond budget summary and our professional development, including individual development plans and college credit. We're approving encumbrances for the, um, uh, for the Safari Montag renewal in the amount of $24,450, defoli equipment in the amount of $23,207.49 for the replacement 
replacement engine for a Heartland Early Education bus and to Alexander Open Systems in the amount of $135,529.92 for the Cisco renewal. Marianne? I move that we approve the consent agenda items as presented. All right, I have a motion. Anyone like to? I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Moving on in our agenda to our public forum. If anybody would like to address the board, now is your time to do so. You're making a move like you wanted to, so we'll go on to our action agenda item, starting with our action on approving construction management at risk firm for Slina Stadium. Good evening. <clears throat> on uh, phases three, four, and five of the Salina Stadium project include uh, concrete rep repairs and accessibility features to the existing seating structure, a uh, new larger press box, and new bathrooms and concession spaces at Salina Stadium. Uh, on March 1st, we advertised for qualification statements to begin the construction manager at risk process for phases three, four, and five. Um, on March 16th, and based on individual evaluations from the Board of Education, the list of six interested construction managers re was reduced to three finalists. Uh, the three finalists were McCowan Gordon Construction, Simpson Construction, and Weens and Company. These three firms were invited to interview on April 4th. Uh, the board was asked to score the technical proposals along with the interviews. Based on the summation of the board's evaluations, McCowan Gordon Construction is the apparent winner and represents the best value to USD 305. It is recommended that the board approve McCown Gordon Construction as the construction manager for phases three, four, and five of the Salina Stadium project and authorize the district to enter into a contract with McCown Gordon. Are there any questions that I can answer? I think it might be important for the community to know that one of the major reasons for choosing McCown Gordon is that they're already engaged in the Central High project and as a consequence, we're able to reduce the costs significantly um, of construction by not having to bring in personnel and um, setting up construction buildings and all of that sort of thing. So clearly uh, it was advantageous to them and to us to choose them. It's a significant savings. So I'll also add that we have been very impressed with McCown Gordon's work. And so we had no reason to think they wouldn't do an excellent job as they have been doing in our other project. Mm -hmm. All right, Marian. I move that we approve the hiring of construction management at risk firm McCallan Gordon for the Salina Stadium phases three, four, and five and direct the administration to proceed with contract negotiations. Okay, I have a motion second. and a second. Any, any discussion before we vote? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7 0. Thank you. Thanks. We'll move on to our discussion agenda items, starting with proposed textbook adoptions with Ms. Exline. I think each of you have a PDF version of a PowerPoint on, minimized on your desktop uh, that uh, I believe Ms. Exline will be referring to. Good evening. <clears throat> Excuse me. I am just here to visit with you about um, our teachers' recommendations for textbook adoptions. We do our textbook adoptions um, on a rotating basis. Anytime new standards are released at the state, we look at curriculum and then at that time we determine do we need a new textbook at that point or um, is that something that we can delay. But we, our um, principals are also recommending texts that need to be replaced as time goes on. And so the texts that are coming to you now are those that we are suggesting, I'm going to lose it here, um, for this year. We, our recommendations are for the following courses. We need um, to adopt some materials for elementary reading. We've been doing that over several years, and I'll explain why here in a moment. Seventh through twelfth grade social studies. We are looking at um, an AP calculus adoption, animal science, health, introduction to teaching, residential carpentry, and cabinet making. And I missed AP macroeconomics on that list as I read through it. So let's start with elementary reading. In elementary reading, we are moving toward a unit-based approach. Over the last two years, you have approved us um, purchasing materials for two units at each grade level. 
we are ready to, our teachers are comfortable with the, that unit-based instruction now, and we are ready to move forward with that. So we identified six additional units to implement over the next two years. And the way that we identified those units is we, um, the, we identified possible published units. After we identified um, publisher units, we gave the teachers the opportunity to submit any materials that they had prepared um, that were units as well, because our teachers have a lot of really strong things that they're doing in the classroom already. So then all of those units were uploaded to a Google Drive, and every teacher, K-5, had the opportunity to review those materials and give input. We really wanted people to have a chance to ask questions, to give input, to give us feedback. And then the grade level teams got together and they provided feedback to the district office. Units were selected for implementation at each grade level. The teams identified six units, but only three will be implemented next school year. The units that were selected for 2017-18 include what's listed here. Four school-wide units. Those are units that must be purchased. They are um, publisher created and we have to purchase those materials for our teachers. Nine Massachusetts model curriculum units. Those are units that are free source materials that are available on the internet that we um, reviewed and that we can download and use. Two Engage New York units, also free source materials that we can download and use. And then three teacher created units were chosen. So that's what was chosen for K-5, three units apiece. And the, so the four school wide units are what I'm asking you to purchase um, for us. The one caveat that you need to know is that we will, as we're developing those units this summer in Curriculum Academy and teachers are reviewing them. Um, and actually developing the instructional plans for those units, they will determine which books, children's books, in each one of those units that they would like to have multiple copies of for instruction. And so probably in July, I'll be coming back to you to say, these are the books that our teachers recommended purchasing multiple copies or purchasing a teacher copy of children's books. So the secondary process was a little bit different. The secondary process, what we do is teachers from all buildings um, impacted by the curriculum adoption participate in the review process. They, they complete a curriculum revision, they develop review criteria, and then they spend time reviewing each resource against that review criteria. They, then they prepare for me a recommendation paragraph, which is what you have in your board packet. And then finally, we work with them to identify what should be ordered because we want to really make sure that they get the teaching resources that they need to best deliver the curriculum. The second thing that we do is we secure quotes from the vendor so that the numbers that you see in your um, board packet tonight are the actual numbers. Um, and the teachers have already identified here are the supplemental materials that we would like to have. So as far as the review criteria, we do have a Board of Education policy that speaks to that. And so we consider that. We consider the standards and curriculum. We consider effective instructional strategies. And then the last thing is that the teachers identify some criteria of what they're looking for in a textbook adoption. So I want to talk about each one of the textbooks and, and specifically what the teachers were looking for because I think it's interesting how that varies from content area to content area. The 7th and 8th grade social studies teachers did participate in curriculum work over the last two summers. That will continue this summer as well. Um, they wanted to meet again this summer to do some additional refinement and to work on some common assessments. The teachers in 7th um, in and 8th grade social studies reviewed all major publishing companies that had a copyright date of 2012 um, or later. And what they were looking for is a book that would provide them with some strong essential questions to ground the learning, some multiple supplemental supports. They really wanted something that had um, supplemental materials that they could use to enhance lessons. And online digital resources for teachers, that's becoming more and more important and you'll see that in, in what several of the teachers groups were looking for. And then they wanted um, resources that had primary source documents that they could have um, students read so that they could balance those secondary sources with primary sources and improve students' reading skills. So I was really excited about that. They did have representatives from each school then meet to review the evaluation forms. And we're recommending purchasing a copy of the text per child 
and then a copy of the teacher materials per teacher. So that's what's in your packet as far as seventh and eighth grade social studies. At the high school level, world history, American history, constitution, and economics, similar curriculum work, similar copyright date. Here they were looking for Chromebook compatibility because as we know, we have that one-to-one -one initiative at the high school level. And so finding a book that worked well and was easily um, used on the Chromebook for students was important to them. They, they were really looking for assessment resources that were a balance of both formative and summative assessments that they could use in the classroom to monitor student learning um, during instruction. And so that, that really pleased me as well. They wanted supplemental supports for struggling readers. And one of the things that you, um, that you may notice is that we're going to be starting to see more and more digital archives be part of our textbooks, which is nice because we've been purchasing those as supplemental materials separately. And so the book, and I think it's the American History book, had a strong digital archive component that our teachers were really excited about. At the high school level, we're recommending purchasing a digital copy of the text for every student so that they can have that on their Chromebook and then a classroom set of texts for each teacher. When I say a classroom set, what we're doing is we purchase one hard copy text for about every two students in the classroom. That way, if for some reason we wouldn't have availability of technology on a certain day because of electrical issues or whatever it might be, um, we, instruction can go on and the teachers would still have a textbook that partners could share. So we don't buy a full classroom set, but one for every two students is about what the high school principals have recommended. I have an asterisk beside that to remind me that I need to tell you that when we buy a hard copy text of a textbook for a, a lower fee than the full copy digital text, we can add a digital text. So when you see the numbers, if I purchase 100 classroom texts, I get 100 digital texts as part of a package. And then the rest of the digital texts that I need, I buy separately at a higher cost. Okay, so that's the reason that the numbers look, that you're, you may be questioning why this number in this class and this number in that class. We also are asking for teacher materials for each teacher. As you look at the high school numbers, there really are three things that impact how many copies of a textbook we buy. One is the enrollment. Another is the number of teachers that are actually teaching that particular class because then I have to have a classroom set in more classrooms. And then um, the third is if they do that package digital text, if they sell, if that particular company sells it that way. So AP Macroeconomics. Um, in AP Macroeconomics, the curriculum is actually determined by the college board. And because of that, what happens is the AP teacher submits a syllabus that's in alignment with that designated curriculum. Our teachers reviewed um, for AP Macro 2013 or later. And again, looking for Chromebook compatibility. They were also looking for a text that was designed specifically for an AP class because this is a college level class, but they wanted a text that was really designed to support a high school learner. And so the, the text that they chose was specifically designed for AP. And they were really excited because it has interactive graphs where they can, where the students can grab something on the graph and move it and see what happens um, and how the economics principles vary based upon that graph. And so that was exciting. It also has something called a customized learning path where um, it's an electronic delivery model where the computer varies what is presented to the student depending on what the student's prior knowledge is. And so again, you're seeing some strong technology-based um, resources and our teachers are looking for those now as they're adopting materials. They, the recommendation for purchase is very similar. Again, you see the asterisk that this was another place where we could buy that coupled digital and classroom text. AP Calculus, again, College Board determines the curriculum. Here we were looking again for Chromebook compatibility, the AP class, <coughs> the, a text designed specifically for high school students. The AP Calc teachers were excited because there was a feature in here where they could electronically assign homework. And when they assigned that homework and students did that, they can still grade the homework, the individual problems. But the, but the um, technology will actually analyze student performance so that they can do a really quick look and say, I need to reteach this. Students already have this to try to save instruction time. So they were excited about that electronic homework assignment piece. 
And then there, there is also a feature where students can get immediate feedback through the website. Um, and AP Calc, as you know, is a very challenging course. And so having that availability for our students um, when they're working at home at night, where a lot of times they would not have anybody who could support them, that's important. And then the last thing was strong video resources for teacher, for the students, so that the students could click on a reteach and a model of a certain kind of problem and have some additional support. And teachers might be able to use that, you know, as pre-teaching as well. But so strong resources technology-wise, again. Um, similar recommendation for a purchase. Again, we had the chance to purchase the bundle set digital hard copy. Animal Science did curriculum work in the summer of 2016. You might recall that this is a new class. This class is replacing plant and animal science because our student interests um, showed that the animal science was really what they were more interested in than the plant and animal. And so this is the first time the class will be taught, first time we have adopted a book for this particular class. We looked at 2013 or later, and what, what this teacher was really looking for, she wanted supplemental resources that could help her deliver the curriculum because it is the first time um, to deliver this particular class. And this particular book had strong supplemental resources and online resources that matched very nicely with the competencies um, that our state requires. Again, similar adoption. In health, again, the teachers did the curriculum work in the summer of 2016, 2013 later. Our health teachers were really looking for ways to differentiate instruction for our high school students in health class. Um, health is taught to our ninth graders, and they were really needing some ELL supports and some supports for students who needed um, additional help beyond you know, traditional classroom instruction. And so that's one of the um, reasons that they are recommending this book. You will notice there is no asterisk here. This is a place where we could not buy that combo package. We had to buy classroom sets, and then we had to pay the regular full price for all the digital copies with this particular publisher. Introduction um, to teaching did curriculum work this past fall, they, 2013 or later. What they were really looking for is a book that had a strong overview of the teaching profession and that really gave kids a good understanding of the history ed of education and of all the forces that are at play when you are in an educational environment. Um, and so the book that they're recommending um, met that criteria that they, were, that they were looking for. There you can see we can purchase that bundle again. And then finally, residential carpentry and cabinet making. We have not, residential carpentry is a new class next year. It's one of our new CTE classes. Cabinet making, we have not um, adopted a textbook for that class in years. And, uh, and so um, these two gentlemen were very excited about the chance to do a review. We've reviewed the last several years and they were not able to find something that they wanted. This year they felt really good about what they found. And um, I want you to notice up there that it says the STEM connections. They have been doing so many STEM connections already in class, but the books that they have chosen actually present those in the instructional materials and um, combine the geometry concepts with what they're learning in the classroom, other science, technology, engineering, and the teachers were very, very excited about that. Um, strong vocabulary, these teachers are worried about kids being able to read and access the text, so strong vocab vocabulary supports. And then also the whole residential construction process because that's new to us. And so um, they were looking for that. Again, this is a place where I could not purchase this publisher, same publisher for both books. I could not purchase a um, combo set. And so the, the numbers look a little bit more even in this particular class. So with that, I will entertain and we'll see if I can answer any questions you might have. Sure. This is a little off the subject, but do you feel like the teachers are, are gung-ho to keep doing your big curriculum academy in the spring every year? Or is it going to stop after this year? Or do you have, what's the future on that? You know what? We... We have different groups meeting this year than we did last year at middle school and high school. Um, and I actually ask them, do you, do you want to meet? Um, they don't have to attend, but interestingly enough, most of them do. <laughs> um, at, in our CTE, just in order for me to be able to balance everything and in some of our elective classes, we have been doing some work during the school year, and you noticed up there that there were several things that were done during the school year, simply because we can provide more guidance and support then. 
um, and it goes faster when they, can, when they can ask their questions and get their questions answered. I would say that over time, we won't need that intensive of an effort, uh, but we really, with the change in standards that was coming at a very fast pace there all of a sudden, we really had to figure out a way that we could all work at the same time, and the Curriculum Academy has worked for that. Um, I think at the secondary level, it is easier to get away from that and to do smaller groups because you don't have 30 teachers in eight buildings teaching the same thing. Um, but again, t the principals ask for volunteers to come, and um, and they I think they do a little bit of arm twisting, to be perfectly honest, because they want a representative there so their voice is heard. So, other question? Yeah, I have a couple in, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, <clears throat> several of those texts that were chosen do have the slightly older copyright dates, 2014 and 15. Right. Um, any concern about those being outdated more quickly? <laughs> Uh, than, than something with a newer copyright might be, particularly in the social uh, studies area? You know, social studies was a real challenge. Um, we, I actually had originally said that it had to be 13 or later, and they were not able to find an acceptable, <coughs> something that they felt like met their needs with that copyright date. And so we said, you know what, in order to give you a choice, rather than saying you just review the one and you get what you get, in order to give them a choice, we went back to 2012. The teachers, and I gave them the option, do you want to delay a year? Because that's, we've been delaying some of these in order to find introduction to teaching as an example. We've delayed that several years in order to find something um, that the teachers were comfortable with. Um, but they, the teachers feel like that what they selected is appropriate and like I said they were excited about some of those digital components and I, I just trust their judgment on that. We typically on a core class look at adoption every seven years because that's what the state does as far as standard update and at that time then the curriculum is revised to match those standards. So by the time we, we up, you know, we're, we're, we're seven years out. Um, you're right. I mean, they're they're going to be a little bit older. The other option is that we wait and see, you know, when those companies come out with a new edition. But um, the companies that they adopted did not have a new edition coming out right away, or we would have asked for a draft copy of it, like we've done in the past. So, I um, do we check? Uh, oh, before I go on to that question, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking for a minute. Um, I wonder if the digital resources in those might be updated, if if those kinds of things could be updated with through that package, or those are not because they're. I don't know. I'm just the curious. I don't know the answer to that. That is something that certainly, if they release something new, that we could check into because sometimes they'll let you buy um, resources separately. Yeah. Since a lot of the digital resources are kind of embedded in that online book as links. My guess is that you would have to purchase the new resource. But certainly, if they would release something, we could ask about that. If there were maybe supplementary resources, it would be easier. Um, another question, and that would be uh, several of the uh, groups mentioned reading levels and so on. Um, how is reading level determined in, in the textbooks these days? Does, does the publisher come out and say the reading level is approximately 6.2 or whatever it might be or do we do reading level checks at all both do we? sometimes um, the publisher will actually tell you the reading level sometimes we do a readability check on it um, and sometimes the teachers just no. know you, you know well you know <laughs> teachers just know this has appropriate vocabulary for my age students so it's kind of a combination of those but um, the readability when they're looking at that a lot of times they're looking at the way the information is, when our teachers are saying that, they're looking at the way the information is presented, the graphics, um, the size of print, the, voca the density of vocabulary in the text. Um, but many of the publishers do give you an actual readability. And most times um, at the high school level, that's still a Lexile, where we've talked about the BAS it's levels what? at I'm elementary. Sorry. A Lexile, it's, that's just kind of a standard measure of readability that is used as you get to upper level text. Okay, anything else? I, I think, oh, sorry, sorry, go ahead, go ahead. I was just thinking some of them, don't they say they'll read it out loud to the student if the student, 
I think I read that in there. But. There are, in several of the textbooks, there are supplemental materials that if there is a student who is um, on an IEP or um, is an English language learner, there are, uh, or very below grade level in reading, frankly, there is a way that the um, text can read aloud to them. And that's being built into more and more texts anymore. I feel like I have a little Larry Michaels here on my shoulder okay. saying, talking about a time that he went into, I don't remember if it was the school or your office after we had bought all these elementary reading books and they were still in the packages. And then also, I feel address that for me, and then also address the fact that do you actually need the paper copies of the books? I know you said you're only buying half of the actual classroom requirement. Do you, we have adopted books in the past, and we've done this in the past, what is the actual rate of them being used? Chromebooks have batteries, and so I don't understand why we need that many actual paper-backed copies. It seems kind of expensive to me. Okay. The, as far as the use at elementary, I'll start there, and then I'm making a note for myself because my memory is maybe not very good. Okay. As far as the elementary textbooks, what we've done, that's the reason that we've tried to get such broad-based input. When we did, and I think that the, the um, adoption that you're talking about was literacy by design. Yeah, I'm sure it was a long time ago, okay. but I just hear him in the back of my mind going. And you know what, and that's a concern because this is a lot of money. Um, what With the two units that we have done, they are on the curriculum map. There are common assessments over those units that um, the teachers have agreed upon from the materials. They've identified, you know what, we want a reading assessment, we want a writing assessment over this that's common. And in order for students to do those, they have to have used the instructional materials. And so that's, that's one way that we get that guaranteed viable curriculum. The other way is that we ask them when, they've, when they're actually working through that unit. The reason that we did not identify already the, the children's books to purchase is the teachers really need to say, these are the best children's books for me to use with all the kids, and these are the ones that I want to use as a read aloud or a mentor text to model the process. <laughs> So I think that teacher input is probably the most important thing there. And then, you know, there is that accountability piece for teaching the materials just because of the writing that we're asking students to do. They can't be successful without that. And our teachers really do want our students to be successful. Um, and so, you know, I have full confidence that they'll implement. I don't know a lot of the history on that, but I have heard that too. So, okay, as far as extra books and Chromebooks. I think that that's a decision that, you, that you're, as a board, that you're going to have to make. If the internet is down um, and our server is down, which does not happen very often, it is helpful to have the um, hard copy text. And it just helps the teacher make instruction go on. If a student doesn't bring their Chromebook to class and there's not a loaner available, being able to take away the excuse of I can't do the assignment well, sure you can. Here's a, you know, here's a textbook. We do have some students um, that parents ask, you know, I really would, we really need for me as an adult to help my child, I need a copy of that textbook. And so in so very few circumstances, we use some hard copy texts like that so that a student can have a copy at home if they don't have internet access and the parent works through the principal to do that. The number of those, the way that we came up with the number, I... I just ask the principals, you know, what do you think? Is this something that we can share? Our teachers would like to have at least one per student um, when, like for a classroom set. Um, but the principals really felt like that one for every two students because we want our teachers using that online resource. You know, we've purchased the Chromebooks and we're purchasing the digital texts. Um, is that just trying, I mean, I'm just going to be flat out blunt with mm -hmm. you. Is it just a way to try to wean the teachers off of the, off of the paper copied books and try to move them, forcibly remove them into using more Chromebook technology? Because to me, I mean, there's got to be a way to look and see how many times they've actually used these books. I mean, one of these you're asking for 144 actual hard copy textbooks. Tell, can you tell me what that book is? World History. World History. World, okay, and World, the reason that that one is a little higher is that at South High, you are teaching World History at both grades 9 and 10, and at Central, you're teaching World History at grade 10 because Social Studies 1 and 2 both really teach World History, 
So you've got a whole extra grade with a classroom set, if that makes sense. So as far as me knowing how often they use them, I don't have any data on that. And I, and I don't know how I would get that absent, you know, asking them to tally, I, I don't know. Any other questions? Seeing none, thank you. Okay, thank you. All right, we'll move on to our school board um, reports and upcoming dates of importance, beginning with our Monday, April 24th, South Middle Ribbon Cutting and Open House at 6.30. Sunday, May 7th, we have our retirement reception and recognition at Lakewood at 3 p.m. Thursday, May 11th, is the DCP graduation at Salina West at 4 p.m. And Sunday, May 14th, is our graduation starting with South High at 2 p.m. and Central High following at 5 p.m. Thursday, May 18th, is our SAEC graduation ceremony at 7 p.m. And Saturday, May 20th, is the Chamber Legislative Meeting at the Chamber Annex at 8.30 a.m. Brett, would you like to start us off with our committee report? Uh, Miriam? Last Wednesday night... I was privileged to attend the Kansas Master Teacher Banquet at Emporia State. And uh, our Melinda Idol presented herself very, very well, as did all the other teachers. Uh, Ken and I felt like this was one of the best crops of teachers, all told, that there has been. They each had its something to say and each one was different from one another and the uh, MC enjoyed uh, telling about Melinda Idol teaching at Gracie Stewart mm -hmm. school and reflected upon the fact that Gracie Stewart mm -hmm. was one of the very first Kansas master teachers mm -hmm. and as of this year we have had over 15 Kansas master teachers from Salina. And it was just a very nice evening. And I'm going to pass the program down so people can see it. Awesome, thank you. Ann? I uh, had to be out of town, so I missed the uh, Heartland Early Education uh, Policy Council this past week, so I don't have any report besides that. Delivered a You Do Make a Difference Award, and good time was had by all. <laughs> <laughs> I have no reports, but I, I do have a meeting that I won't be able to attend coming up, CKCIE, which is 8.30 next Wednesday. Not this, not tomorrow, but the one following. So if anyone would like to volunteer to take my place for that, I'd be more than happy to have a person step in. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, I'll take up everyone else's opportunities. Um, I was a busy bee <laughs> um, of late. Um, I attended the master teacher celebration with um, Miss Mary Ann and Mr. Hall. That was the most incredible evening. It truly was, and, and um, just looking at the list of Salina educators that had that honor um, not to uh, miss Ms. Mary Ann Trickle and Mr. Ken Trickle and Ms. Carol Rander. I mean, I, I was like, it was, it was amazing. And then to see the, um, the, the one award, the W.S. Black, I believe it is, um, award, which is a, a selection, that, that particular award is for one of those master teachers who they don't know that they want it because they're being observed for the entire day, and then they're selected by that committee. So it's it's really some, I'm like fingers and toes and eyes are crossed that Melinda will be that wonderful person that's selected, but it was, it was an incredible, wonderful, humbling experience. So um, I was really glad to be there. And then, what else did I do? Oh, and another little tidbit, not only did, was Gracie Stewart one of the first recipients. But Melinda went to Gracie Stewart when she was in elementary school. And now she's teaching at Gracie Stewart. And now we're full circle and she is the 2017 recipient of the Master Teacher Award. I mean, that's phenomenal. Okay, I'm, I'm done with that. 
Um, I did attend the um, district health council meeting on yesterday. I'm, I'm really enjoying that meeting now. It's really kind of interesting. We are looking, um, I think the, the, the highlight is the fact that um, as forward thinking as USD 305 is, we are going to have signage on all, bid, on all buildings. No smoking, smoke free, lungs at play. I mean, there's going to be some recognition that there's no cigarettes, no chew, no electronic for anyone that enters the building or is around the building. I think that is, um, it's amazing, it's wonderful, it's, it's a good opportunity. And so that went out to all the principals and so forth so they can make those selections. Because they're what? Free. <laughs> we like free. Um, I also yesterday participated in, watched, whichever one I participated, um, a webinar sponsored by KASB um, Legal Advocacy Group on employee leave and FMLA. Um, very, very, very informative, extremely informative, and um, I have, I, it, I just tucked it away in my feather of things that I'm learning about um, life as a school board <laughs> member. Um, there's, a, there's a lot to, to be said about what we need, what we do as a board, what the, the, the Board of Education does as a, as a team, um, and then what our teachers do as a, as a part of that team. So it's, um, I've enjoyed what I have done thus far. So that was, that's all my reports, I think. Yeah, yeah that's it. Are you sure? I, I'll well, give you some more time I'm really not sure. It. I really think that there's something else in there, but I'm gonna leave it there. All right, well, I delivered the You Make a Difference Award to I'm really sorry, I cannot remember her name. I just kind of, it was there and then it went off. I think it was Michelle, but um, the speech language pathologist who wasn't actually there. Yeah, it was a rather interesting experience for me. I went and drove to Cottonwood and, and um, got in there and right when there was an emergency, a little girl had busted her head open. It, there was stuff everywhere. It was kind of a, a crazy day to be walking in there, but they kind of, carted her to the nurse's office and then they, they ushered me into a, room, a tiny room with these tiny little chairs and they're like, you sit here. And I was like, I don't think my, I'm, I don't even know if my legs can fit under that chair. So I sat in this little chair and I, I, there was a little screen in front of me and all of a sudden there was this girl there and, and, and she was a very sweet, sweet person, very confused on what I was doing. But once I explained to her what was going on, she, she was very, um, very emotional and very appreciative of that. She was from, I believe, Michigan. Um, and she remotes into the school via whatever software program that, that we have. Um, and then I got the opportunity to then watch a couple of the preschoolers. They did it in pairs. I got to watch them actually partake in that whole process with their pair that was there. I thought it was um, a very, uh, very interesting way to deliver instruction that way and they were very engaged um, for being so young to actually be able to sit there and, and not have her physically present but to be able to still interact with her um, and then I was able to tour um, Cottonwood and got to watch I believe it was the first grade classroom do their um, creative play where they're given um, a set amount of time and they're given that time to then build and design whatever they want and um, that was a very interesting process too. They wanted me to play, but I was like, I gotta get to work, so <laughs> I gotta do something. Somebody's gonna come tracking me down. So, so that's that's all I was able to squeeze into my time. So I think if anybody else doesn't have anything, we'll move on to our superintendent's report. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Also, uh, and, and in reference to what you're referring to, that software is Presence Learning, uh, and that is a one mode that we used to provide speech language pathologist services to students in our cooperative. Uh, primarily because of the difficulty that we've been having of hiring speech language, pa speech language pathologists now. On the other hand, I'm very happy to report that, that Mr. Lowers is over there kind of grinning almost ear to ear because he, it appears that we've hired at least two and maybe, and he's got his lead on a third, right, which is a big deal. So uh, I think presence learning has filled the gap uh, in, in, in the situation where we have a difficult time hiring staff. Uh, but obviously, I think even with uh, as, as effective as I think presence learning is, we still it can't replace that, actually having a, a live speech language pathologist right there in front of the students. So Mr. Lowers continues to work and plug away and try to hire more SLPs, right? So we'll continue that, we'll continue that process. I also had an opportunity, and I, I appreciate what uh, Ms. Newsom as well as Ms. Strickland shared about the uh, 
master teacher award dinner that was it was good dinners but i think it's my fourth one now that had the opportunity of attending and they just do a really nice job I, one thing i did notice is uh, the first one that i attended back in 11 or so you still had the hard copy portfolios and now everything's electronic portfolios and so i thought that was kind of interesting as well but you could kind of go through and see all their all the work i thought that and and melinda idol did such a really nice job of representing salina usd 305 so that was a great event uh, and then really the only the last item i have went well besides the fact that i toured the high schools and and had an opportunity with mr stevens to kind of give me a breezing tour through the new uh, east wing and and uh everyone seems i would say most people are where they need to be although not everyone as of that time were, were was there yet they were still in the process of moving and bringing things over but it's really kind of eerie uh because you go into those pods and there's like nothing there you know and there's still furniture there and it's just like everybody just left and so it's kind of like a ghost town of a pod so i thought that's just kind of interesting but uh so i do appreciate mr stevens taking the time to, to show me through um, through south highest construction the last item then obviously is that the, our legislature is on a break a three-way a three-week break uh, we did have a school funding formula that was, uh, has been proposed. It's House Bill 2410, which is probably a good first attempt. It's not where we need to be, ultimately. Uh, but it is a five-year, $150 million plan, which is about a $750 million proposal. Um, it does raise the base uh, from, to th right now, I think it's 3820, $3850, right? It will raise it to $4,006 in, in the first year, $4,206 the second year, $4,406 the third year, 2019-20 be $4,606, and 2020-21 would be $4,806, and then they would put CPI increment increases each year at, thereafter, and so at least there's a, a mechanism in place to at least have that increase with the cost of inflation. And so uh, that's a good, as I said, it's a good first step. Enrollment's going to be based on, and again, this hasn't passed yet, there's still a lot of conversations that need to occur, but enrollment will be based upon prior year to the second preceding year, which could be a drawback if you're a growing district. You're not going to have the dollars to to provide support for those kids for a year down the road, you know. So they're going to go prior year and then two prior years. Uh, At-risk funding still going to be based on free lunches. All day K will be funded, which is a big deal. At, at, up until this point, it, it's always been it's always been funded at half day. And even though we had 95 percent of all the districts in the state have full day programs, and so it's good to see that they decided to go ahead and fund that all day. Uh, special education funding still remains the same as the current law. They just needs to they just need to fund it. And, and it's at 90, it should be at 92%. I think this past year we were like 80, 81%. So it's still quite a way short in terms of where they need to be uh, for funding special education. And, and a good thing for our school system is that they included new facilities waiting. We put that back into the formula, which will be extremely important for us, especially as we're completing all these, these uh, buildings. And so going into next year, if some version of this were to pass and included new facilities waiting, it would bring in considerable new resources for at least two years. Uh, to assist us as we as we build the budget for those new facilities. So, as I said, it, it's a good plan to start with. Um, I still think that they there's a ways that they need to go. I'm not sure where the court's going to weigh in on that in terms of compliance uh, with with their decision, but uh, but it is a good first step. And so it's good to see that. So, and that's all. That. Any, any questions? I I just wanted to mention that, and and I don't know. I brought it up the last time about schools for fair funding, and you said you'd get these folks yes. on. Are you getting it now? Yes. That latest report from mm -hmm. Schools for Fair Funding is something everybody should take a look at, as well as the information that came out recently from KASB on that very issue Absolutely. of um, the finance bill. A um, lot of things in the works there that Absolutely. are kind of interesting politically. So yes. uh, I encourage you all to read that. That's all I have. And I believe we need an executive session for attorney-client. Uh, yes, Madam President, if we could request 30 minutes, please. Okay. Would anyone like to make that motion? I move that the Board of Education go into executive session at 625 for 30 minutes for the purpose of consultation with Board Legal Counsel on matters which are privileged in the attorney-client relationship, which if discussed in open session would waive that privilege, and that the Board of Education reconvene into open session at 655. Is that right? in the conference room. All right, I have a motion and second. a second. Any discussion? Hearing none, all those in favor, please raise your right hand. All those opposed, same sign. Motion carries 7-0. We will reconvene at that time.